All right, everybody, thank you for joining us today. I want to thank everybody for joining us. This is Humidity Hardwoods and Homes. Uh, this is a, uh, a event with a couple different groups here. We've got the NWFA, April Air, and of course, uh, Sawhorse Builders. So again, thank you for joining us. We got a mix of, I'm sure, builders, HVAC contractors, wood flooring installers, and some others. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send out a quick poll real quick, if you wouldn't mind just filling that out and telling us um, who you are. You just, just all you got to do is make a selection. Um, and then we'll have a better idea of who our audience is today. So while you're filling that out, I'll finish the introductions. Um, I'm Joseph Hillemeyer. I'm the marketing channel manager here at April Air for the new construction channel. I work primarily with our builder audience um, on delivering and marketing IAQ solutions in the home. I'm joined by two other experts today. Um, I've got Brett Miller of the NWFA and Matt Hoots of Sawhorse Builders. I'm really excited to have you guys listen to Brett and Matt today because they're not only experts in their respective industries, but they also understand the role that humidity plays in those industries. Uh, April Air is a proud member of the NWFA and very excited by all that they do for wood floor education. And we're also honored to be a part of Sawhorse and Radic Green's 1920s makeover ATL home, which Matt can tell you a little bit more about in his section. Gentlemen, thank, thank you both for joining me today. And without further ado, we will kick it over to Matt. All right, so my name is Matt Hoots. I'm with Sawhorse Design Build. Uh, we're here in Atlanta, Georgia, and I want to share, I haven't really shared this with many people, but I've got an abnormal fear. It's called hydrophobia. It's the fear of water. As a general contractor, I don't like water at all. Um, and the reason is, is, you know, we have water coming in through the roof. If there's a leak there, or if a branch hits the house, or if there's a bad penetration, water coming in through the walls, Got an image here. This is a project that I'm actually working on with April Air, um, and we're creating a learning house where this house uh, is very leaky. We had water coming through the foundation, through the walls, through the roof, through the windows, kind of every orifice of the house, and it was leaking like a sieve. So, you know, where is the moisture coming from in the houses? I want to talk about mostly the building envelope, and the building envelope is the outside of the house and how moisture comes in. Um, Mostly we're gonna talk about how humidity and vapor barrier comes in. So in this illustration, we are showing, you know, this is bulk water on the outside. And again, most of us understand that we need good flashing techniques on the outside to keep bulk water out. Um, but you, you also have water coming in through the foundation into the crawl space and the humidity is building up in the crawl space. You could have bulk water uh, coming in, but you could also have just water vapor coming in through the foundation. So let's talk about humidity for a second and how humidity comes into the house. So many of you guys have heard of what is called the stack effect. And what happens, and this is, this is an illustration uh, for warm climates or during the summertime, um, as the hot air or the warm air rises, and usually warm, you know, warm air, uh, vapor, also um, pressure, it's always going from high to low. So basically this, this is, the warm air is, rising, going through the roof. Um, and, and what's happening is it's creating a pressure difference um, when it's doing that. So as it's going up, you have to have makeup air or air is coming into the house. So as air is coming back into the house, as the warm air is rising and escaping out through the roof, the windows and all the other holes, uh, you're basically, if you're in a humid climate zone, you're bringing in humid air, uh, typically where you've got that lower pressure. Um, so off to the right, uh, you've got showing, you've got a high pressure where it's going uh, through the attic, going through the attic walls. Uh, you've got a neutral line that's, that's, that's in the middle. That's, that's kind of a neutral pressure where you don't really have a lot of air leakage right there. But typically when you have those musty houses, um, because you have all those damp crawl spaces, you also have damp basements. Uh, what's happening is as the air is escaping through the second level, the main level and into the attic and to the outside, you've got the negative pressure in the basement and crawl space sucking in all that unwanted air. So let's talk about a couple of ways that humidity is entering uh, through the house. So the first principle we can talk about is diffusion. Diffusion is actually where the water is moving through the building materials. This is normal and we actually encourage this. We don't want to um, have water vapor getting trapped inside a wall assembly because that's where you have rot, you've got mold, you've got other issues. Um, so diffusion is where the, the water vapor is going at a very, very slow rate. Um, and this, this rate uh, is determined by a perm rating. Um, if you have zero perm, that means nothing is going through that material. And 
in your outside wall assemblies, you want to have something with a perm rating so water can actually go through it. Again, the, the idea here is for the materials to be able to dry out properly so this water vapor does not get stuck in the wall. So the difference between a perm rating and if we're looking at infiltration, uh, if you have a hole inside a uh, material that has a good perm rating, basically the perm rating is negated um, completely because you're basically sucking in that water um, through with in the air and the airflow is bringing all that humidity or in some cases dry air with it and it's quickly uh, changing the humidity conditions or the, the, the water vapor conditions inside the house. So this is a, you know, a great illustration I've seen in many presentations. So if you're looking at the difference between like water diffusion and air leakage, and so if you have a typical four by eight sheet of drywall, diffusion uh, over a month period of time, because again, water is gonna slowly migrate through it, depending on which side, uh, uh, again, it's gonna move from high humidity to low humidity. So during the winter time, it's gonna move from the inside of the house to the outside of the house. And then during the winter time in most climate zones, it's going to, again, these, these are you know, non-arid climate zones, it's gonna move from the outside of the house to the inside of the house, because you're, you're gonna have lower humidity inside the house during the summertime. But you're only gonna have a third a quart of water during one month. Now, if you have a penetration with a one inch square hole inside that piece of drywall, you can have 30 quarts of water over that period of one month. So you can see that, yes, we are worried about water going through the materials, but what's more important is making sure we have all those holes sealed up in the building envelope, in your drywall, in your different control layers to make sure that you don't have all that water vapor going into the house. Because again, this water is gonna affect your health, the comfort, um, hardwoods, um, lots of other things, and also possibly create some conditions where you have uh, microbial infestations and stuff like that, like mold. So, you know, there's, there's lots of different uh, penetrations, especially, the, and this is showing an example of a second floor where all the air, and this is, this is uh, usually a wintertime condition. So as you're heating up the air inside your house, it's uh, basically going through all those holes and, and, and heat transfer through fluid, water, air, this is called convection. Like you have a convection oven, we're basically heating your food using the air moving around the oven. The same thing with your house. So if you have a very leaky house, uh, you've got lots of uh, heat transfer through convection. So the goal here is you can see all these penetrations. And, and again, the larger arrows are showing that you've got more air leaking out of those areas through convection. So in this case, um, during the, the winter time, um, if, it's, if it's a low humidity outside and it's a higher humidity on the inside, because you want to you know, keep it around 30 to 60%, depending on your, your, your climate zone, all, all that air, all that warm air as it's going out, is also taking that water vapor with it. Um, you know, in addition to uh, looking at the different pressures on a house and how the, the pressures affect um, the water coming in and out, air coming in and out, you also have movement within a room. So if you have a balanced uh, room, or in this case, we're, we're showing um, you know, conditioning on the outside wall, you've got a convective loop. Now, again, these loops, as things move around, um, are going to move some of that water around as well. So like if you're lower to the ground, it's gonna be less humid. The, the higher you go up, it's gonna be more humid. So these are other building science principles that you need to keep in mind when designing houses. So air leakage requires two things. It needs a hole, and you can see in this, in this, uh, this illustration, we've got two holes, and you need a pressure difference across the hole. So when you have a pressure difference, um, essentially, it's gonna to try to, to, to create an equilibrium. So the bigger the hole, um, essentially you've got air can leak out much faster and also the bigger the, the, the bigger the pressure. So if you have a large pressure difference between the inside and out, and you know, what are some of the things that can create this pressure difference between the inside and out? Well, wind is one of them. When we have a blower door test, this is simulating a condition where wind is blowing at like 25 miles per hour, 20, 25 miles per hour, and with that, you're able to create a pressure difference between the inside of the house and the outside of the house. And again, if you have these holes in the house as the wind's blowing across with this pressure difference, you're sucking some of the air or some of the air is being sucked out and also they're gonna have some makeup air coming into the house. You know, the, whole, the whole idea here uh, when talking about the building envelope is to basically make sure that you don't have this pressure difference. Uh, and again, you can't always control that, but if you reduce the size of the hole, if you have a very, very tight, what they call tight building envelope, an envelope is where your air barrier meets your thermal barrier on the outside, 
If you don't have a lot of air going through that, then a lot of these things that we're talking about aren't going to be that big of a deal. So you can have a, a pressure difference between the inside and the outside of the house. But if you have a tight building envelope, you're gonna lose air at a much slower rate. So that means your conditioned air that you're paying a lot of money for doesn't go out the window. Or if you have a negative pressure inside the house, you're not sucking in all that hot, humid air or that dry air, depending on what time of the year it is inside the house. So um, again, we're, when we're looking at directions that pressure moves, it always goes from positive to negative. So you can see in the first illustration, it's a positive uh, pressure inside the house. And again, this is positive compared to the outside. So if, it's, if, it's a, if, the, if the passables are higher on the inside than it is on the outside, that air is going to go out. So this means that if you have a positive pressure, if you're bringing it in like fresh air ventilation, but you, if this isn't balanced, what, what's happening is you're, all that conditioned air that you have is basically being pushed out. Now, when the air is being pushed out, you're also pushing out some of the humidity. And this is a bad time during the winter time. So if, if in the winter time that you have that, that positive pressure and you're trying to keep the humidity inside the house so it's more comfortable, then that, that's an issue. Uh, you know, conversely, also look at the, the negative pressure. If you have a negative pressure inside the house where you have an exhaust fan on, um, I've got this situation in my house every now and then. We turn on the, uh, the range hood and or the bath fans. And if you have all of the exhaust on at the same time, you're actually creating a negative pressure inside the house. And if you're not controlling this building envelope, like where the air can come in, if you don't have uh, fresh air inlets that are, that are filtered, what's happening is you're just bringing in unconditioned air from wherever the path of least resistance is. In our place, it happens to be like a fireplace right next to it. So I had to seal up our fireplace. And I'm also working on a balanced ventilation system for our house. So we don't have this negative pressure condition every time we cook, take showers, et cetera. So this is a, another illustration, uh, similar to the one we had earlier. Uh, you see that dotted line that basically is, is across, that's like your neutral zone. Um, the positive pressure is gonna be towards the top of the house. Remember the positive pressure with that warm air is trying to go out. Um, and as that air is going out, you're basically sucking in air because you've got that negative pressure below it. Um, and, and again, you're sucking in that unconditioned air. And typically that unconditioned air is going to have the, you know, the same humidity, whether it's low or high as the outside. So that's what we're trying to avoid here. So here's a good illustration um, showing, uh, and this is somebody was doing some uh, renovation and this is a multi-story building. You know, the perfect example of the stack effect. So what's happening here is you've got a positive pressure on the outside, just like that we have in our other illustrations, but that air is trying to get out. So it's pushing that tarp out at the top, showing that you do have a positive pressure. Now, conversely, at the bottom, you've got this negative pressure, um, you know, with no reference to the outside, it's basically sucking that air in. And with the, with the, the positive on the top, the negative on the bottom, you also have a neutral pressure, pressure plane where the, the tarp's not getting sucked in or out. So this just happens to be a renovation that someone is doing. They put a tarp up there. Somebody saw a picture of it, took a picture. It was like, hey, this is a great illustration, demonstration in real life showing that you do have different pressures in a stack building with the stack effect. And we've also got some, you know, neutral neutral planes. Um, and, and, and the neutral pressure plane is, is in the middle. Now, so when you air seal and insulate a house, um, so if you insulate your roof line or you just deal with a crawl space, what happens is you are changing that neutral pressure plane. Um, and with this, if you have hardwood floors, if you have cabinets, um, you have to be very careful, especially if you have a leaky house, because you're changing the conditions of humidity and pressure inside the house. And that, that could, could affect some of the finishes inside the house. Um, here's just another example, just showing some vectors. Uh, again, the vectors are showing that the higher you go up, the higher the pressure towards that, that neutral pressure line that's gonna be you know, getting closer to zero. And again, most of the air um, in, this, in this building that's a stack effect, the, the lowest pressure is gonna be at the very bottom. And what's happening is you're sucking in all that stuff off the ground, mold, mildew, um, things out of, out of the ground. Uh, this is also a good case for uh, bringing radon into a, a building. So if you're, in a, if you're in an area that has high uh, radon levels, uh, we do have high radon here in Atlanta. Um, the stack effect actually can suck that radon in from the ground if you don't have that vapor control layer at the very bottom. And in some cases, what it does is it, it can actually use that elevator shaft, if not designed properly, to distribute the radon to some of the top floors. 
because it's basically using the stacked effect to bring in these harmful chemicals from the ground. So some of the things that we want to share with you, and I just want to go over some of the, you know, the reasons for talking about this. Um, the main thing to do is have a tight building envelope, air seal, air seal, air seal. And uh, many people ask, you know, how, how do we make sure that our house is designed properly and how do we create that good air seal? Well, I've got a, a link here uh, and we'll put these in the chat as well um, and also in an email after the presentation. But getting a green certification typically means there's some sort of testing on the house. Um, now, on the 1920s makeover AT house that, that, that April Air is involved with, we are running a blower door. Uh, we ran a blower door, um, and you saw that was the, the first, this first slide was a slide that we had, and it was um, an, an image of the house where we had no sheathing, we had no vapor barrier, we had to have any control layers. So these control layers that were missing on the house allowed water to come in, allowed vapor to come in, allowed air to come in, and the insulation was pretty much negated as well. So on this house, we're going to put proper control layers in. Uh, we've got a virtual walk through the house. You can see how bad it is right now. And we're actually in the permitting process. We're going to start construction, starting from the ground up on that pretty soon. Um, I've also got a link to some green building products um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the bottom below. This is at Rated Green. And with this, um, you can actually look up some of the products that we're using uh, to install in your projects um, on, the, on the next renovation. Now, at the very end of this, I want you guys to make sure, I know we went over a lot of information really quickly. Uh, I want you to uh, make your list of questions. Um, once we're done with this full presentation, uh, the first 10 people that ask questions that uh, we think we can share with the, the, the public, uh, we're go we have a prize for them. All right, thank you very much, Matt, I appreciate it. Very informative. We've had a couple questions roll in. Uh, we'll we'll get to those at the end. We'll have a, we'll have some time there. And anything we don't get to at the end of the webinar, we'll do our best to uh, answer via email from one of the three of us. Or, uh, you know, uh, if it's if it's super technical on the HVAC side, I might send it to someone else. But we will try to answer all of your questions here today. Brett, you take it away now. Excellent. Thanks, Joseph and Matt. Thank you so much. That was a, a very well and easy to under well explained and easy to understand. I, I really appreciate the um, the information. Uh, my name is Brett Miller. I'm Vice President, Technical Standards Training and Certification here at the National Wood Flooring Association. Also the technical editor for Hardwood Floors Magazine. Um, Going to talk a little bit um, following what Matt had talked about. Obviously, everything that Matt talked about affects wood floors. Wood floors. Um, do react to moisture, wood in general reacts to moisture. As a wood flooring professional, it's our re responsibility to make sure we understand how that moisture affects wood floors and how we can try to, to control that moisture. First way is what's going on below that wood floor, and this ties right into what Matt had talked about with the, the vapor retarders and the moisture control. Um, International Residential Code, classifies vapor retarders into three different classifications, class one, class two, and class three, all based on the permeability of the membranes or the barriers that are used. NWFA specifically writes the guidelines and standards for the wood flooring industry. And in there, we specifically designate that over an unconditioned space, like a crawl space, unconditioned crawl space, or an unfinished basement, or a garage, anything like that, we suggest using a class two vapor retarder. That can be sheet goods or, or liquid applied membranes over wood subfloors. Um, that slows the rate at which moisture potential laden air moves through that subfloor assembly and into the wood flooring. I think what's important to understand is wood flooring is really a barometer of everything that's happening in that home from a, an environmental perspective. It's a very expensive barometer, but it is a barometer. And that's why I think it's important to understand how to control this moisture. Um, that all said, it's the installer's responsibility to control the moisture from below, but also, as it, as it states at the bottom of this slide, never use a vapor retarder over a wood subfloor to remedy a known moisture condition and never install a wood floor over a known moisture condition. Um, that's easier said than done, but because moisture conditions aren't always that obvious. Different types of vapor retarders that are used in the wood flooring industry are sheet goods products, as I mentioned earlier, similar to what you see on, on, the, on the display here, or liquid applied membranes, which are more and more common these days. Um, vapor retarders work over wood subfloors by 
minimizing that moisture flow through that subfloor assembly and into that wood floor. They don't stop that moisture. What we don't want to see happen is using a class one vapor retarder or also known as a vapor barrier um, to stop all of that moisture. And the reason is once you stop moisture at, at a space, especially over a wood subfloor, you create a, a place for moisture to, to build up. And that buildup can cause mold growth, it can cause subfloor rot, decay, and even fastener degradation. We don't want to cause that. We don't want to create issues within the building structure. So we want something that's breathable, but that will slow that rate of potential moisture laden air. Concrete subfloors are another uh, item and another substrate that we commonly install over. We hope and wish and, and pray that uh, concrete was poured over a vapor, a class one vapor barrier. Um, but we have no way of determining whether that, that class one vapor retarder is intact or whether it was installed properly or whether there was holes in it or whether it's doing its job. So anytime that we install a wood floor on grade or below grade, we suggest to the installer that they install a class one vapor retarder on top of that concrete slab also. What that does is it stops moisture from getting into the wood floor assembly. Above grade concrete slabs or elevated slabs, um, we suggest after moisture tests and evaluating that slab, we still suggest using a vapor retarder, but really on grade and below grade are, are our most common sources for moisture infiltration. Moisture infiltration happens a lot of different ways. And again, as the wood floor being a very expensive barometer within a home to determine what's happening in that home and what, what the moisture conditions are like, it's important to understand where that moisture comes from. Matt talked a lot about where a lot of that moisture can come, thr come from, whether it be from below ground, through foundation walls or exterior walls. Um, it can ca be caused by improper drainage, uh, improper slope around the perimeter or, um, or, or downspouts. Um, and also even other wet trades within the building, creating uh, moisture conditions inside the facility. What's important to understand is that wood and water don't mix. And, and that's kind of a, 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 contra a contradictory to, to the facts. The fact is wood needs water, trees need water to grow. But it's, as, as we use wood as a flooring material, we need to understand that wood is a hygroscopic material, meaning wood absorbs and releases water. It releases moisture. And in doing so, it shrinks and swells based on that loss or gain in moisture, similar to a sponge. Uh, if you buy a sponge at the grocery store, you know that that sponge is a specific dimension. But when you dunk that sponge in a bucket of water, it swells, it gains dimension. And yet when you leave it out on the countertop and you let it dry out, it shrinks and it loses all of that moisture. And it's a good analogy to compare what wood does in those same types of environments. In a living tree, moisture can be anywhere from 30 to 200% the weight of the wood substance itself. It's fully saturated with water. In order to use wood as a flooring product or as an end use product, it must be dried in order to retain a consistent physical property within the conditions that it's installed in. Even dry wood contains moisture. And that's what's important is from a wood flooring perspective, we need to balance that amount of moisture in the wood. The moisture content of wood depends on the amount of moisture in the air. is is quantified as relative humidity, which Joseph's gonna talk quite a bit about. Um, but the performance of wood in those conditions is, is what affects that, that wood floor and how it reacts. Wood in high moisture content or high relative humidity environments absorbs moisture. Wood in low relative humidity environments releases moisture. And in doing so, again, it's, it swells or it shrinks. This slide shows the real, the real um, the sweet spot for where wood performs best. And there's no coincidence that if you look down the left-hand column, the temperature uh, in which wood performs best is somewhere between 60 and 80 degrees. We'll just call it 70 degrees is that medium spot. And the relative humidity is somewhere between 30 and 50%. What this chart is showing is what moisture content of wood would be at any one of these temperature and humidity combinations. What's highlighted in the middle shows that 30 to 50% humidity at 60 to 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, wood is dried down to this moisture content. It's dried somewhere between most wood flooring, matter of fact, most lumber manufacturers, when they dry wood down for interior use, 
they dry wood down to somewhere the target range is between six and nine percent moisture content. And that's because that's the conditions in the home interior in which wood performs best. As wood shrinks, it releases moisture. And again, as I said, as it expands, it absorbs moisture. Repeated cycles of this can distort the shapes of wood. This picture on to the right was uh, an engineered hickory wood floor that was exposed to dry conditions in a desert climate, such as Colorado or Arizona or Nevada. Um, as it dried out, that hickory wanted to shrink and it shrunk so bad that it started delaminating and dry cupping and, and really self-destructing. Um, that's dry conditions. Wet conditions, wood swells, it, it, it expands, it cups, it buckles. Um, and really what's most important is that these effects within the space affect the entire building structure, not just the wood floor, furnishings, woodwork, furniture, doors, everything. This picture is showing some of the, the different effects of just the wood floors. Um, the one thing with wood floors is that they're the item in the home that everybody walks across. They're the most visible item within the home. And they're the first item that gets called out when there's a change to that, to that flooring, whether you get cracks or splits or, or a buckled floor. Um, even in minor fluctuations in temperature and humidity, a little bit of high humidity, um, say 20 or 30% change in relative humidity from season to season can cause wood to swell just enough to get that little edge lift there on the bottom right-hand side. Or in the winter months, a little bit of low humidity, 20% change in humidity can cause wood to shrink up a little bit. You can get finished stretching and a little bit of gaps in between those boards. To minimize distortion and maintain consistent shape and size of any wood floor, the key is to control the humidity. And that's really where, as Joseph said earlier, wood flooring and, and relative humidity are, you know, they, they go hand in hand. And if you understand really the key zones where a wood floor can be maintained effectively and where it can, you're, you're guaranteed to see failure, it's important at this slide, you can take a look at those humidity zones and really where wood flooring is gonna be the most happy and it's gonna perform best. And the best part about all of this, as Joseph's gonna get into, is controlling humidity between this 30 and 50% range or even upwards of 60%, it's not that challenging and it's not that difficult. And it's not just the wood flooring that performs best in those environments. It's, it's everything within that home, and, and including the person or the people occupying that home. Once you get into those failure zones, and I can tell you being from a desert climate out in the Colorado market, 25, you know, five to 25% relative humidity is not abnormal in the winter months. And it's very common to see gapping in between floor floorboards. Um, but it's not that difficult to increase the humidity within the home to minimize those effects of wood floors. As Matt mentioned earlier at the end, we, we strongly encourage questions. Um, our contact information will be up and we'll make sure to answer any of those questions at the very end, but please submit your questions. I'd love to uh, engage in, in more conversation about the effects of humidity and moisture and, and what they have on wood floors. Because at the end of the day, again, a wood floor is a very expensive barometer to determine what's happening within that home. All right, thank you so much, Brett. That was extremely informative. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, April Air and the NWFA have uh, had a relationship and a partnership for a number of years now, and they have some unbelievable technical people uh, involved with them who can help you out. We've had a good relationship with some of their wood floor inspectors and trainers. So if you got a question about anything in your wood flooring and in, in, in your builds, or if you're in a home doing HVAC work, uh, be sure to be sure to reach out and take up Brett on his uh, offer for questions because you'll get some some great answers. Thanks again, Brett. So, real quick, we're going to kind of go through. Uh, you've you've heard everybody talk about it a little bit, but what what really is relative humidity, and why is it such an issue in a home, and, and how is it different than the other ways that that we experience temperature and climate? And you know, kind of in a nutshell, absolute humidity is the amount of moisture vapor in the air as expressed in grains. And relative humidity is the amount of that moisture vapor in the air as compared to the amount of moisture vapor that the air can hold. And that is, of course, expressed as a percent. The warmer the air, the more moisture it can hold. The cooler the air, the less moisture vapor it can hold. And you can see that on the right. So what we're showing here is temperature is going up and down, which means that yellow circle, the amount of moisture vapor that can uh, that air can hold is changing. However, the absolute humidity or the actual amount of moisture vapor in the air, the blue circle is not changing. 
So because of that, your RH changes as that temperature goes up and down. Um, and you know, changing temperature only changes the relative amount of moisture, but not the actual amount or the absolute humidity. So if you don't physically increase the water, you lower the RH. And the image on the left will show that as well. It's a bit of a simplification. Uh, and if you want to get into psychometric charts and some of the super technical stuff, we have that uh, on AprilAirPartners.com. And some some folks at April Air who are way smarter than me get uh, get really detailed on some of this stuff. But again, very basic. You got an air temperature of 80 degrees. You've got, let, let's say, 80 grains and a relative humidity of 50%. If you take down the absolute humidity to 40 grains and you just keep the air temperature where it is, you've now got a relative humidity of 25%. So without making any impact on temperature, you've lowered that relative humidity. So, you know, the takeaway here is what you need to know is that temperature control equipment is not the most reliable or efficient way to manage RH. You really do need dedicated solutions that actually remove or add moisture vapor to the air. So, you know, air conditioners are great for heat removal, sensible change, but they can't remove water vapor uh, and, and impact that the latent conditions without also lowering temperature. So again, you're not using the right, uh, and, and that causes overcooling, which is uncomfortable. Uh, it, it's not, it could be unhealthy as well, uh, but it, it's definitely uncomfortable. It's not a condition in the home that, that somebody uh, is gonna feel their best at. So you, that's, you want to avoid that whenever possible. Conversely, when you heat and you increase the amount of water vapor that the air can hold, the only way to bring that back up is to actually add moisture to the air. Uh, as Brett touched on, you know, wood floors and people uh, fortunately have kind of a similar zone. Uh, and when you get out of that zone, they feel similar, just like wood can crack and check. People experience pain and itchiness in their eyes, nose, and throat. And this is because that that dry air and dry conditions sucks that moisture out of your skin, sucks it out of your eyes. Any kind of membrane that can hold moisture, that dry air is trying to quench its thirst. It comes after anything with water in it. And that can include our bodies just as much as the wood floor and, and the house itself. We've all heard uh, plenty about viruses in the last uh, 18 months. You know, one of the reasons, uh, in addition to being outside and being in a ventilated space, that there's always a belief that, you know, wit winter time increases this is because you have drier air in the winter. Virus particles, any kind of particle really is able to hold in the air longer in that drier air, whereas that moisture air will bring it down to the ground. So viruses actually become a little bit more uh, infective. Uh, when, when you have dry air because they're hanging in there longer, those particles are staying in the air longer and people can get sicker. Uh, surprisingly, one of the number one things, and we've been a humidifier company for a long time, um, and anyone on here who's who's familiar with uh, you know as SEO, search engine, and the different ways that people find solutions online, static shock was is a huge one uh, that drives that drives traffic. It's kind of the thing that people really understand as a result of dry air, especially if they're in uh, northeastern or northern Midwest climates. They've experienced that in the winter where they've uh, you know they've they've turned their heat up. They don't have a humidifier, and all of a sudden they're they're getting shocked every time they they touch a doorknob. So uh, again, we're as, as, as Brett said earlier, wood floors are expensive barometer uh, of the conditions in your home. Your, your body is a, kind of a barometer that uh, is obviously with you all the time. If you feel uncomfortable, if you feel these impacts in the home, even if you don't have a way to measure humidity, that's a good sign that it's probably not correct. If you're cold and clammy uh, in the summer, then you probably have too much moisture in the home and you're not dehumidifying properly. If you're dry, itchy, and there's a lot of static shock in the winter, that's a pretty good indication that you probably need to add some humidity to your home. So when, when we choose these products, kind of where do we start? Well, the first thing again is climate zone. Uh, you know, this is a huge country. We don't all experience uh, the same conditions inside or outside of our home. Uh, and in addition, you know, we've got kind of microclimates mixed in here as well. I mean, it's mostly divisible by what we would consider the north, south, east, west, kind of desert coastal, but but within that there, there can be some abnormality. So you really want to have a good idea of the exact climate uh, in the area where, where this house is or, or uh, the customers who are buying the floor. But overall, different climates, no matter where they are, face different humidity challenges. And the amount, um, the, the, amount, the amount of humidity that's present, the type of home ventilation that there is, is there any ventilation? Is it negative ventilation? Is it positive pressure ventilation? All of that along with the climate will have an impact on the indoor RH. So, it, it, in a dry condition, so we'll go back here real quick. Uh, probably if you're, you know, if you're in zones six, seven, five, uh, these 
humidifier products are probably going to be fairly common in your area. You've definitely experienced this in the winter. You turn up the heat, you start to dry out that air. Very common solution for that is an evaporative humidifier in those areas. That's a device that uses heat and airflow to turn water from a liquid to a gas. This gas is then dispersed using the HVAC blower evenly throughout your home. So the humidifier increases the amount of absolute humidity in the air, which also increases the relative humidity of the air. So back to those original slides, a humidifier is the piece of equipment that is actually going to be able to add moisture to the air and change that RH. If you're just, if you're just playing with temperature, you're not gonna be able to do that. Um, evaporative humidifier is uh, kind of the original humidification technology, but it's still very effective on forced air systems. Now, some of you might be asking, well, what if you don't have a forced air system or, or you have a, a radiant system or you're not entirely sure about the capacity of an evaporative humidifier? Well, uh, there's also steam humidifiers on the market. April Air makes one as well. And this is a humidification device that uses electric current to take heat from water to a liquid to a gas. So this gas is dispersed using the HVAC blower through the HVAC ductwork, or we can also hook it up to a dedicated fan, uh, which will allow it to be dispersed throughout the home, even if you don't have ductwork. As long as you have that whole hole capacity, you're still going to see um, uh, you're still going to see that RH level come up in the entire home. Kind of back to what Matt talked a little about about with stack effect. I mean, humidity is going to move around the home. It's not just going to stay in one place. So as long as you've got that capacity there, you're going to be able to supply enough humidity for the entire home. Steam is ideal for larger homes, uh, applications that require large amounts of humidity, or uh, applications where you need to do something independent of a heating call. And Brett kind of touched on this when he talked about that. Uh, you know, some of those arid climates you might have a situation where even in the in the summertime when you would be air conditioning you could have uh, low humidity in the home uh, and then that would be a, an instance where you could actually with a steam humidifier you would be able to add humidity to the air uh, without a heating call which is what you would need with an evaporative humidifier now the other side of that coin uh, is high capacity dehumidifiers so if if we go back and we're in those lower climate zones one two three four uh, particularly in the summer, how, how do we handle the, the latent burden there? Well, we're going to need a dehumidifier because as I mentioned, that air conditioner is not going to be able to, in most cases, remove enough of that moisture while also keeping in mind the comfort of the individual in the home. So when you're properly dehumidifying, you can reduce and eliminate the different organic odors that come in the house as a result of high humidity. So that's mold and mildew. Uh, you're obviously protecting your wood by keeping that moisture level down. Uh, as Brett mentioned, it's that that constant cycle of, sh of shrinking and swelling, shrinking and swelling that does the most damage to the wood. Uh, so a dehumidifier is going to be your solution that prevents that in, in the summer months. Um, and, you know, ultimately, th there could even be some saving on energy costs as well if you're, if you're using it correctly. Because of that correlation between comfort and, and humidity and, and temperature and humidity and the way they relate to comfort, if you're, if you're taking that moisture out of the air, you're actually going to be comfort. Uh, you're going to be more comfortable at a higher temperature. So, you know, 74 and 50% humidity feels much, much different than 74 and 80% humidity. So a dehumidifier is a key part of uh, achieving comfort in the home in addition to health and protecting that wood floor. Uh, another key time that you'll find these operating, uh, especially if you're, not in a, if you're not in a real coastal area, you might think, well, you know, I've got some high humidity here and there, but my air conditioners, I could probably take care of it. Well, it could if it was running, uh, but air conditioners are set to run based on temperature, not on humidity. So uh, these devices will operate during, uh, you know, shoulder seasons. So at a time of the season when you still have high humidity, but you don't have a lot of air conditioning, your air conditioner is not running because it's not that warm outside, uh, or maybe in the evening hours when temperatures dropped a little bit, but humidity is still high. So it's dehumidifier, definitely one of the most uh, essential tools if you want to protect your wood floors in a humid climate and in the summer months. Uh, ventilating dehumidifiers uh, are, are another way to go if you're bringing in, and there's a lot of different ventilation solutions in um, for, for the builders and HVAC guys on here. I mean, you know, that's obviously, that that's a whole nother webinar to get into that. Uh, but I, I do want to touch on that if you are dehumidifying, if you are ventilating, again, that's a key time that you need to keep uh, the amount of moisture that you're bringing into the home uh, on the top of your mind. So we have a ventilating dehumidifier uh, where as you're bringing that air in, if the humidity is too high, it will take that out before it delivers it to the living space so that you're not actually taking um, 
humid outdoor air and dispersing it all throughout the home. You need that fresh air in there. Uh, it's it's healthier. Uh, there's definitely benefits to it, but you don't want to introduce it into the home if it's still high in moisture. Um, and you know, last but certainly not least of all of that is, is the control of it. Um, you know, you want a, a thermostat that in some way allows the homeowner to CRH and have some control over it. For the most part, these products are, are set it and forget it. Certainly if you have an automatic control, uh, you know, you don't need to be, you're not going to be adjusting humidity uh, quite as much as, or uh, the, the RH as much as temperature. You, you want to set it so that you're within that range that we've talked about for wood floors and human health. But it is good to be able to have an eye on it, uh, either to see if maybe something in, in the home has particularly changed. Uh, maybe there's something wrong with your equipment. So being able to monitor the conditions in the home for the homeowner is great. Uh, and of course, now that you know there's more um, smart solutions and mobile devices for the homeowner to do that, that's going to help them stay uh, um, you know, well informed on the conditions in their home. So when you're choosing whether you want that evaporative humidifier or that steam humidifier, um, what's kind of the, the main things you'll want to consider? Well, the, the first thing you'll need to consider is how much moisture do you need to add to the air? So those evaporative humidifiers are not going to have quite the same capacity that those steam ones did, as I mentioned. But if you've got a really tight home and you're around 15 square feet, you're only 1,500 square feet, you're only trying to add maybe around seven gallons per day to the home. You'd be able to do that pretty easily uh, with an evaporative humidifier. If you've got a looser, larger home, you could you could need to add as much as almost 40 gallons per day to the home. In that case, you're definitely going to want a, a steam humidifier. So first thing, figure out your square footage and decide how tight or loose your building envelope is. Af after that, you kind of go back to that climate map. This is a little bit simpler version of, of the climate map. It doesn't have as much of those microclimates and, and the humid line. But again, it's going to be a good starting point. Either in the south, you're in the Midwest, you're in the Northeast. Uh, or in your, you're in the drier areas of the mountain or, or the desert southwest. So get those selections first. Then from there, again, this is the April Air product lineup, and anybody you're, you're looking at it may have similar technology. We do certainly have uh, one of the most complete suites of different humidification equipment. And the reason we have so many, you can see right here, is that after you've chosen that climate zone, after you decided the size, or confirmed the size of the home, then you need to look at the type of equipment you have. You can add humidity regardless of what type of equipment you have in the home, whether it's boiler, baseboard, heat pump, gas oil furnace, single stage, multi-stage, it doesn't matter. There's a solution for it, but you need to choose the right one to make sure that that home is getting the proper amount of uh, humidity throughout the entire year. You'll see on the right here for the desert Southwest, we almost always recommend our steam humidifier. We do in every single case. That's because there's a good chance that you're going to want to deliver humidity uh, when there's not a heating call. So you need that product that can operate independently uh, of a heat call. Other than that, you're going to have some options on whether you use an evaporative humidifier. They come in bypass, which relies solely on the HVAC blower. There's also power evaps, which, which can be used. Uh, they have their own fan in them, so they don't need to rely on that, um, the HVAC blower. Selecting the right solution for dehumidifiers is also similar here. Figure out if you're loose or tight. Do you have an 80? Are you loose or tight? And then how much moisture do you need to remove from the air because of that? Our dehumidifier model numbers uh, are a direct indication of how much uh, moisture they're able to remove. So the E80 can remove 80 pints per day. Uh, the 100, 100 pints per day, and the 130, 130 pints per day. So again, if you're in, if you're in a loose home in Region C, uh, you're definitely, um, you know, you, you're going to want to consider. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, if in Region A, you're in a uh, looser home, you're definitely going to want to consider, you know, may, maybe the larger model there. So um, it's it's really uh, it's just going to come down to, to the size of the home and how much moisture you need to get out of there based on how tight that building envelope is. Now, it is important to say that while all of these things are great uh, starting points, um, there is one variable, and this is the hardest one to account for, and that is what are the people that are living in the home? Uh, what are they ultimately uh, going to do to the conditions in that home? Because no matter how good a home looks on paper, uh, you just you can't be 100% sure of the way it, it, that it's going to be lived in. And that's why dedicated solutions for dry air and dehumidification are uh, you know, essential as kind of an insurance policy to make sure uh, that both your wood floors, uh, the health and the integrity of the building are protected. So you know, if, if you're not convinced uh, that you need these solutions, think about what people could do. I, you know, I mean, 
do they cook a lot? Do they clean a lot? How often are they cleaning? Do they have dogs? Uh, do they have kids? Do they have hobbies that might create um, a lot of moisture? Do they do they have musical instruments or maybe uh, maybe they're a cigar aficionado? I mean, any one of those things could change what their individual need uh, for humidity in the home is. And no no home plan, no matter how complete it is on paper, is going to be able to take all of these into account. They require mechanicals that can kind of call an audible when needed uh, and, and either de uh, deliver moisture or remove moisture from the home. And again, that's going to give you the ability to con control pests, reduce odors, uh, and, and improve comfort and have healthier air. Going to close on a similar slide to what, what Brett did. This is kind of, um, th this is the, the ash rate chart that's similar to sort of that red light, green light, uh, yellow light that you saw there. There's a healthy zone uh, for human health. It's According to ASH rates, between about 30 and 60, April or kind of prefers between about 40 and 60. As you saw some from Brett's presentation, you're a little bit more in that 40 to 50 range for wood floors. But the important thing is that you need to stay within that band. It has a low side and it has a high side. Um, so that might require one solution. Maybe you just need a humidifier to add some moisture uh, in the winter. Maybe you just need a dehumidifier to remove some of it during a shoulder season. Or maybe if you're in, as we are here in the Midwest, we have a little bit of both. You, you might probably need both products to make sure that you're staying within that band uh, at all times. So once again, I want to thank uh, all you guys for attending. Um, I know we threw a ton of information at you there. Uh, we will be sending this to you. Uh, when we're complete here. So if you didn't catch everything there, there will be a recording. Uh, we're going to try to, we'll try to answer a few questions right now. Uh, definitely no way that we'll get through all of them. They've, they've been rolling in like crazy here. I've been looking at them out of the corner of my eye. Um, Matt and Brett, I don't know if you guys can see the questions, so I'll just, I'll just pick a few here. Uh, but, um, you know, certainly uh, you guys can answer any of them by email after this. Um, so if we don't get to your question again, look forward in the email. We, we will do our best to answer all of them. Uh, if you have any desire to go further on the HVAC side of things here, go to AprilAirPartners.com. You can learn a lot more about our solutions uh, as well as, um, you know, as I said, more information on the impact of uh, humidity and temperature and uh, all sorts of technical information. If you want to know more about wood floors, you need more information. The NWFA is a great organization to go to there. They have uh, some wonderful uh, stuff on their website. They can definitely help you select the right type of flooring, subfloor, uh, all those things that, that you need when you're, when you're choosing that for your build. And uh, <clears throat> Rated Green is a great resource to find green building materials. And they've also got a great community there of people talking about and exchanging ideas on building uh, healthy and, and efficient homes. So please, uh, we're all here because we want to share those resources with you. So if you get a chance, uh, go and check those out when we're done here. Uh, Matt, I think this is a question for you. One of the slides mentioned that humid air is lighter than dry air. That seems counterintuitive as humid air contains more water. Can you explain further? I believe that's related kind of to uh, the atomic weight. Uh, but yeah, this, yeah. Go yeah ahead. this is strictly chemistry. Um, I studied chemistry at Georgia Tech. And basically, if you remember back to the periodic table, um, uh, oxygen is 16, nitrogen, I believe it's 14. Uh, Hydrogen is one, so H2O, which is water vapor. So you have two hydrogens, which is two, one oxygen, 16. So that's atomic weight of 18. And if you look at just oxygen, uh, o, which is uh, O2, is 32. Basically, that water vapor is going to be is going to weigh less. Now it doesn't feel like it weighs less because it's not pleasant to breathe, but the the, the water vapor is uh, atomically uh, less than, than 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 oxygen, nitrogen, and the other elements in the air, um, even like uh, carbon monoxide, I mean, dioxide and stuff like that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Brett, a question for you here. Uh, Jonathan Lee says, our hardwood floor subcontractor installs both a liquid applied vapor barrier and a sheet good vapor barrier. Is that okay? Um, it shouldn't make a difference if moisture below that subfloor isn't a concern. We don't suggest doing that much moisture control over unconditioned space. If there's a potential that whether it's an unfinished basement or a crawl space and moisture can find its way up and into that subfloor assembly and you have that much moisture control blocking it from getting into your wood floor, ultimately your wood floor is going to love it. It's not going to be affected by what's coming up from below. The potential concern could be 
blocking all of that moisture at that space. If you've got um, whatever the, the joists are built of and whatever the subfloor is, it's likely going to be wood. And with that much moisture condensing there at that, that space, you're likely going to get, uh, or at least the potential for mold growth, potentially rot. Uh, mold growth can start as low as 16% moisture content, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, rot can begin at 28 to 30% moisture content. So when that water starts accumulating at that area, um, you have the potential for both of those to begin working. And that's where, I mean, nobody wants to hear the M word, the mold word. But when that happens, um, obviously there's there's potential liabilities involved. So I would be cautious with that. But more importantly, make sure you understand what's happening below that wood floor, below that subfloor assembly, um, and make sure the moisture is controlled prior to it even being able to get into that subfloor assembly. Great. That was a good question. Thanks. Um, Dan Aaron asked, do you have a checklist or order to check things in the house to assess problems with installed wood floors? Uh, I'm confident you guys have that. I know when a wood floor inspector goes in, I'd imagine one of the first things he's probably going to do is just look at the moisture content of that wood. But what could a homeowner start to look at? Yeah, that's a great question. And we do. We've actually got a very thorough job site checklist. Um, historically, we've even had one for builders, uh, pre-building job site checklist. But this job site checklist we have is available on our website. It's for our members, it's free. For non-members, you can purchase them. You can even customize, you put your own logos and stuff on there. But the beauty of that is it gives estimators, it gives the specifiers, it gives the installers, it gives everybody the ability to, to walk the entire job site inside and out and check mark off boxes as to what is appropriate and what may not be appropriate or what could cause a potential issue down the road. Um, we never want to see a floor go to the inspector. We don't want to see failure and then a wood floor inspector come in after the fact. Ideally, this job site checklist allows the installer and the homeowner and the builder and everybody who's involved to avoid going that, down that road. Um, we do train inspectors to look at causes for failure. A lot of times they'll be leaning on that job site checklist to see what kind of information was, was logged prior to installation or at the day of installation, and that can all be very helpful. But yeah, if you reach out to me um, afterwards, that's great. You can also get on our website, uh, woodfloors.org, and, and download a lot of that stuff. Um, but I'd be happy to, to share it with you also. Great. I've got, uh, Brad, I've got one more question for you, but I, I want to answer one uh, real quick here. And I, uh, Matt could probably chime in as well. Someone said the dehumidifier guidelines referenced loose and tight homes. Please divine these terms. Uh, yeah, I mean, that you know, that it, that is a, a little bit of a, a loose term, <laughs> no pun intended, I guess. But what, what we're really referring to there is air changes per hour. And Brett, maybe you could, I'm sorry, uh, Matt, you could maybe uh, just talk a little bit more to, you know, how you would define a loose and a tight home. And again, if people want an example of that, the uh, 1920s uh, ATL is going to be a great example of loose versus tight. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for asking these, these really good questions. Uh, make sure to send or in the chat give us your email address so we can get your contact information so we can send you uh one of these masks and the mask was uh linked in the chat uh, for those who for those of you who have uh, other questions uh that we can't get to during this time period we're also going to uh host these and discussions on rated green as well so we can send you a link to that answer um but you know with regards to this particular question uh a, a, the the code and this and this is like defining how leaky is a house in air exchanges per hour at a certain pascal. So ACH50, uh, I believe uh, three ACH50 is uh, code. Um, so essentially, if you have a new house that's built like today, it's gonna be a tighter house. If you have an older house, it's gonna be a leakier house. So with a renovation, um, like this, this house that was built 100 years ago, it was the leakiest house that this the particular auditor had ever tested. And he actually wrote a book on testing houses. So um, typically anything that's uh, built in the last 10 years will be tighter because we've, we've, we've actually put an emphasis on making uh, tighter building envelopes. But really the, the way you're gonna know is have so somebody actually test the house. Um, the, the really, the, the, that's, I mean, you can even have a new house and do a performance test on it, pressure test it with a blower door and it could be leaky. So uh, the, the only way you're gonna know these things is actually do the testing on the house to make sure you've sealed up all those, uh, those areas. Great, thank you. Um, 
another great question here uh, referring to the chart on humidity and failure rate. Brett, this is going to be for you. How long would a building have to be at that low failing humidity to see those effects on that wood foot? That's a great question. You know, we don't want people to, uh, to you know, to, to to freak out if they run downstairs and see their humidistats, you know, at thirty percent for a couple <laughs> hours. How, how long does that actually need to occur? No, and that is a really good question, and I appreciate you asking it and 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 your comment too, Joseph. I think wood will react to changes in in temperature and humidity and moisture. It it's not immediate. Um, it's not a blanket answer. I can't say, you know, after seven days, you'll start to see that. Um, different things can affect how quickly wood reacts to the changes in conditions, such as the species itself. Some species are more stable than others and won't react nearly as much. Um, the type and amount of finish on that floor can also affect how quickly moisture affects it. Um, in general, when wood's exposed to a, 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 Matter of fact, from a from a biological perspective, when wood is exposed to higher moisture conditions, it will change a little bit quicker than when it's exposed to low lower. So going from a dry state to a wet state, when you add water to, to wood, it will start swelling. And it, it may take, uh, depending on how much moisture, it may take hours or days. Um, However, when you introduce wood to a low humidity condition, it actually takes longer for that wood to off gas that moisture that's inside of it. Um, so it, it really depends in some cases uh, for, for wood to start losing moisture. If it was exposed to that danger range, let's say it was in the middle of the winter time in the desert climate and you're at 10% moisture, 10% relative humidity, that wood will start shrinking and you'll probably start to see effects within a few days. Um, if it's exposed to those conditions for longer periods of time, like weeks, you're, you're going to start seeing those effects compound over over that amount of time. Um, but in general, it's not one of those where, yeah, like you said, if you walk down and you see your humidity is below 25, you, gotta, you better start making phone calls. It's not that extreme. The beauty of wood is it does have a memory and it'll always go back. That's why we we, we love the natural product of wood so much because although it's a barometer and it tells us what's going on it's also pretty predictable once you understand what it does thank you very much brett uh i'll take the last question here a bit of a product question can an iaq wi-fi thermostat be used in place of a model 62 control uh yes it can the the april air uh wi-fi iaq controls can control any of our humidifiers or dehumidifiers uh, that you would be installing nowadays so if you want to add that uh, level of control, uh, some smart control to your home, uh, you can definitely go ahead and do that with our line of IAQ thermostats. Um, and a similar question to that, uh, smart control, can we get more information on smart thermostats and control for dehumidifiers? Christopher, yes, I will, I will send that to you um, after we get off here. So guys, we're right at our time limit. I'm glad we were able to answer some questions for you. We will go, if, you're, if you didn't get your question answered, uh, we're gonna go through all these and we'll get those answers to you via email. A few people asked for contact information. Um, uh, I'll, I'll get that to you as well on behalf of uh, all three of us. Uh, guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you to all the attendees who are here. Uh, I hope you learned a lot from Matt and Brett uh, and my, hopefully myself as well provided uh, a little bit of information. So again, we were so glad you guys could join us. We'll answer your questions when we get a chance. And uh, we've got emails for a lot of you here. We'll get you a mask if you were one of the people that asked the question. So thank you so much. Thank you all for being here and thanks for your time today. And thanks everyone.